peace be with you all. This is the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Matthew, chapter 5, 1 through 12. Let us be attended to the Holy Spirit's presence to illuminate and revelate to us the deeper things and deeper meanings of Christ. Seeing the crowds, Jesus went up to the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so men persecuted the prophets who were before you. This is the word of the Lord. Happy are they who hear these words, believe them, and obey them. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord, oh my soul. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, oh my soul. Praise the Heavenly Father, speak to us today a word that will quicken our spirits and our souls to the reality of our divine nature and sons and daughters of your kingdom. Illuminate us, Lord. Transcend our limitations intellectually and empower us spiritually to acknowledge and to accept your call and presence in our lives. Feed us not the milk of thy word only, but the bread and the meat of thy word, that we may become fully nourished in all aspects of life, and thus manifest your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. We pray it in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Uniquely, God makes reference to prophets after he preaches the Beatitudes to them. He's teaching them about the kingdom. He's teaching them about the mind of Christ. He's teaching them about the life of the kingdom. He's teaching them about a countercultural approach to navigating the waters of life. See, the difference between the priesthood and the prophet is priests contain what they know and nurture, but prophets break apart the tradition. Jesus broke many traditions. People don't like prophets because prophets make you think outside of what you can control. And that's where we <coughs> suffer in spiritual growth and enlightenment is we want to camp out on what we know. We want to camp out on what we were taught 
And we want to protect that and defend that. But that's not the way of the kingdom. The kingdom cannot be boundaried and controlled on that level. And so one of the most powerful things about the nature of Christ working through Jesus is that a countercultural approach to navigating life is declared and we actually find in what we call the Beatitudes or the attitudes of being <laughs> what life is really about and how to navigate the traumas of our life and the disappointments of our life and the challenges of our life. Are you here this morning? And so we are actually taught by the Holy Spirit through the life of Jesus, the Christ, what the kingdom looks like and what the mind of God looks like. You have the mind of Christ. But most of us try to make the kingdom carnally minded, not kingdom minded. Rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven, he says, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. <clears throat> People do not want to hear cultural, countercultural concepts that they trust. They don't want to hear the concepts that we've developed in our lives and the boundaries we put up and the beliefs that we have declared we do not want disrupted. And therefore, the danger of that is we become whitewashed tombs, dead men's bones, because we seek to expand and go, grow and evolve spiritually. This was Jesus' problem with the Pharisees. They were excellent in defending the tradition, but when he come to said, it's okay to sit with a Samaritan woman, it's okay to touch a leper, it's okay to lay hands on that which you see is unclean, they couldn't deal with it. We're that way. Are you all here this morning? We're that way. People are searching for ways to deal with the challenges and uncertainties and difficulties of life. We're all searching for answers. We all want to be fulfilled. We all want to be satisfied with life. We're looking for fulfillment and satisfaction. So how do we move forward? <coughs> What are we to teach and tell our children and our grandchildren? How do we teach the next generation to think like God? Or do they think the way our fathers and forefathers thought? Does our cultural and family tradition override kingdom enlightenment? And so they learn from us by watching us on what is the value system. And what's sad is that we fear the prophetic because the prophetic is a countercultural answer to our comfort zone. We don't like prophets. They hated the prophets because the prophets will come into your secure world and disrupt it with a greater knowledge and a greater truth. We messed up in the 70s and 80s. We thought the prophetic movement was about prophesying blessings over people naturally. You're going to get a new car, a new house. You're going to find the right spouse. We, we messed it up because rather than disrupt the culture, <coughs> we actually empowered the culture and made the church a place to get our carnal desires fulfilled rather than kingdom life released. We don't like prophets. We like priests that teach. You know, people don't like when Father comes down here and prophetically tells you the reality of this altar, that it's not some symbol, it's not some ritual. It's a living place. We don't want to hear that. We don't like it when somebody tells us the way you've interpreted Scripture is in error. Because the person who taught you was in error. And the person who taught them was in error. And a prophet's come to set things back in divine order. Are you all here this morning? You don't, the crowds don't follow prophets. The crowds run from prophets. 
because prophets attack the security system. The carnal security system gets challenged. The cultural system gets challenged. So Jesus is teaching his disciples. Most of us have been taught to navigate the waters of life. Most of us have been taught to navigate life and the waters of life with these things, power. You need more power. You need more strength. You need more accomplishment. You need more acquisition and more control. We've taught to navigate the trials of life with power, acquisition, and control. And so what happens when we're insecure, we use fear. We actually try to navigate life with domination and intimidation. When something challenges us that we're not comfortable with, we use domination and intimidation to deal with our fear. It's okay. God channels divinity through humility. The Bible says in James 4, he gives greater grace, therefore it says God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. In other words, you can't be a prideful person and try to pray healing over somebody because God's nature, his healing nature, resists that pride. So when we have people who preach, well, if I be a prophet, what do you mean if you be a prophet? If you are prophesying out of pride, you've just blocked the channeling of God's divinity to what's happening. God cannot transmit or transfer or channel his healing, delivering power through prideful vessels because he resists the proud. So how could his nature go through that? So we get the Beatitudes to help us realign our mind and realign our approach to the navigation of life. Are you all, are we going somewhere here? Because this whole year is about perception. Our perception has to change. So when I feel afraid, am I going to become intimidating and dominating? If I feel challenged, am I going to stand my ground and fight, or am I going to say, excuse me, I'm sorry? We were taught to have strength, power, acquisition through domination and intimidation in order to navigate our problems. That's the way of the West. <clears throat> and that's the way we believe we get our way. Most of us have been taught to navigate, I'm going to say it again, let's all say it together, with power, with strength, with accomplishment, with acquisition. If I just had more money, if I just had more influence, if I just had more recognition, and with control. Jesus is about to blow that concept out. He's about to say, if you want the mind of God and kingdom life on earth, that's got to go. And it's a daily task. Well, you all aren't happy. <laughs> because you've learned how to use this intimidation and domination to get your way. We work to be rich so we can have what we want. We don't work to be rich to be rich. We work to be rich so we can get what we want. Nobody's happy just being rich. You get rich to get control and have what you want. We seek power so we can take what we want. Because if I have more power than you, I can get what you can't get. So we want strength to get what we want. We want richness to... oh. We argue to be right so we can have our way. If I'm right, I can get my way then. So that's why we argue so much to be right rather than in relationship. We'd rather be right than in relationship. We compete to win so we'll be respected and admired for our effort. We actually destroy our lives to win sometimes so we can be acknowledged and accepted. Winning is not always the goal. We want to be beautiful and attractive 
So we'll be liked and desired. We want to be desired, and we think the beauty of our external man will make us desired. What we drive, where we live, how we dress will make us desired, and we're missing the whole boat. And Jesus comes with his countercultural prophetic message and says, all of that is for naught. It's in vain. Any of that sound familiar? Have you ever tried any of those ways in your life to get what you want? <laughs> I have. Those attitudes find their origin in the idea that we are all self-made. Self-made is an anti-kingdom concept. We are self-made men and women. We sell that. Then we are told to build up ourselves and make a life for ourselves. You need to build yourself up and make a life for yourself. After all, we must look out for number one, because if we don't, who will? For too long, that has been the myth which we have lived. Kingdom teaching flies in the face of that myth. Kingdom teaching flies in the face that you're self-sufficient and self-made. Kingdom living says, I've been bought with a price. I'm not my own. I've been redeemed outside of myself. I don't stand alone. I stand in community. I don't stand alone. I stand in creation. I don't stand alone. I stand with all things in perfect harmony in the creation of God. <coughs> it's a myth that you're self-sufficient and self-made. We're all one phone call and tragedy away from dealing with the pain of not being self-sufficient and nobody beats father time you can get all the money get your savings your 401k get everything lined up but there'll come a time none of that will fix your problem there'll come a time that none of that can straighten you out i'm trying to help somebody here do we raise our children that way or do we keep feeding the monkey do we keep feeding the carnality do we keep feeding the identity do we keep feeding the self-sufficiency do we keep feeding this control do we keep feeding the domination do we keep feeding the intimidation or have we come to break that power off the next generation and teach our children and grandchildren to have the mind of god and that walk in the divine nature We're proud of it. We're proud when we can intimidate. I'll show them. Nobody's going to talk to me that way. We're proud of it. But Jesus comes along and says, let me tell you what it's like now. Are you ready for the attitudes of being? What I'm going to do is I'm going to go through them. I'm going to give you what he says, then the an antonym for it. So, so we can see it. Okay. It's not through power, strength, or accomplishment or acquisition that we navigate life. It's not about overcoming circumstances. I know I preach a lot about overcoming, but transformation is more important. It's not about overcoming other people. It's about overcoming ourselves. It's about overcoming myself. Know thyself. Because the problem is not my circumstances and other people. The problem is myself and my ability to overcome myself and be aware. As Deacon Damien said, these are the attitudes of humility or the attitudes of the divine. Blessed are the poor in spirit. The world says blessed are the prideful and self-sufficient. Blessed are the self-confident. But Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit, the humble who says, I don't need to prove myself. To be poor in spirit means I don't have to prove my value. It means I don't have to prove my value to you. I don't have to prove my value to strangers. I don't have to prove my value to anybody. I just have to overcome self and say, I belong to God. I don't have to prove my value to the world. We would end all this crazy stuff in our culture if we stopped trying to prove ourselves to the world. No. It's prophetic. Not popular. 
because we work so hard to prove ourselves. But Jesus, I'm just, look, Jesus was the vessel that delivered and channeled the mind of God. That's who Jesus was. He was the firstborn who channeled the mind of God so that many of us could begin to channel the mind of God. Are you here? Blessed are those who mourn. The world says blessed are those who revel in pleasure, who revel in celebration. But the kingdom says blessed are those who have a spirit to mourn for the true condition of things. We try to cover up the true condition with reveling in pleasure. How many else still like the prophetic movement? (laughs) Blessed are the meek. The kingdom says blessed are the meek or the gentle. The world says, blessed are the prideful, self-confident, and arrogant. Who promote their accomplishments. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. The world says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for advantage. Blessed are those who found a way to get advantage over the system. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. The world says, blessed are the judgmental and condemning, for they will feel better about themselves by identifying the weakness in somebody else. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. But the world says, blessed are you when you can cut somebody down by condemning them, shaming them, and judging them for their efforts. That's what the church does. (laughs) Oh, y'all, I love you. Blessed are the pure in heart versus blessed are the manipulating and conniving. Not blessed are the pure in heart. The pure in heart say, this is what I really owe, I'll pay it. The conniving say, well, I'm not sure I owe that much. Do we raise the next generation thinking this way? Honesty and humility? Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. Not the intimidators. Not the dominators. Not the contentious. Some people just like to argue. Some people just want to be the devil's advocate. They believe that's a sign of strength and value. Rather than humble. God channels divinity through humility. And then he said, blessed are those who are persecuted (coughs) for believing all this stuff. Blessed are you when you believe that and other people say you're a nut job for thinking that way. Because I can guarantee you some people watching this and maybe even in this room think I'm a nut job for even preaching this way. Well, now, Bishop, that's just not realistic in our generation. That's why it's God. Because he uses the foolish things to confound the wise. He puts to shame the wisdom of man. That's why it's God. is because it's not comfortable to your flesh. It's not comfortable to your emotional carnal mind. But it's the nature that channels. uh, If you want to see healing, if you want to see deliverance, if you want to see prosperity, if you want to see influence, we're going to have to start channeling divinity through humanity and not standing on the ground of arrogance and pride. God gives more ground. Lord, help me. I feel like the old days. This takes me back to my early days right here, but I didn't know how to preach it then. Because I'm going to tell you something. When I was on the radio preaching this stuff, I was preaching out of a spirit of pride. I was preaching prepare for war out of pride. 
I was preaching thinking the message I had was a better message than somebody else. And it was successful for a while. But God is not going to continue to channel his favor through pride. I don't care how nice you dress it up with praise the Lord, brother. He's not going to channel it through pride. Are you all still love me? Well, I know God does, so I'm okay. That's how we navigate life. This is how we're supposed to navigate life right here. This is how we meet the challenges and the uncertainties and the difficulties of life. This is what we are to teach our children. This is what we are to teach our grandchildren. A lifetime of living the Beatitudes or our attitude of being day after day, year after year, is how we overcome ourselves. The Beatitudes are not simply helpful hints for happy living. They are descriptive of God's mind and God's heart. They're kingdom values and reveal what kingdom life is like. They shape and form our lives and reveal the divine nature. Most of the time we twist and distort God's life and longings to fit our own life and longings. We manipulate it to fit what we want. That's why the Beatitudes are so radical and seem so far out of reach. And as we hear Jesus' words and consider the Beatitudes, it's easy to look at ourselves and say, that's not me, that's not the world, and that's definitely not the church. You are right. It's not me, and it's not the world, and it's not the church. We tend to look at what we are not, but God looks at what we can become, and God looks at what we're called to be. He doesn't look at what we're not, but pride has to always identify what you're not, where grace and the love of God identifies what you can be and what you're called to be. And that's why the church is so frigging sin conscious, pardon my language, so, so sin conscious is because it wants to identify what we're not rather than what we can be and what we're called to be. Blessed are you when you're persecuted because then you're called sons of God. The temptation to think that the Beatitudes are rules and conditions for being blessed or receiving a heavenly reward, they're not that at all. They are not about building up, accomplishing, or acquiring anything. They're about letting go. Everybody say letting go. They're about surrendering and living a vulnerable and open life and heart to all people. That does not mean we run away, back down, or isolate ourselves from the realities of our life and the challenges that we face. It means we engage them in a different way. Everybody, let's all say it together, a different way, a different approach, Christ's way. The Beatitudes teach us to trust God more and the external circumstances less. <laughs> to invite dependence on the divine rather than self-reliance. In today's word, that sounds a lot like weakness and foolishness. This all sounds like weakness and foolishness. That's what it sounds like to every generation but to those who are being awakened, it is the power of God. To those that are being awakened, this is the power of God. God chose the foolish to shame the wise and the weak to shame the strong. The Beatitudes are nothing less than the way of the cross. They're a way of dying to self. They're a way of dying to pride and allowing Humility to channel divinity through us. <laughs> they invite us to depend on God rather than self. So in the trauma and setbacks of life, we discover that we cannot do life by ourselves. 
Nothing stands alone. As we admit our need of God and the need for the help of others, we find purity of heart. That's how you become pure in your heart is you admit you need help to live life. You're not self-sufficient. That's how you get purity of heart. The arrogance of self-sufficiency, which is really the Antichrist spirit. Self-sufficiency is an Antichrist spirit. There are already many Antichrists in the world. There's already a lot of self-sufficiency spirits in the world. Oh, I'm getting in trouble. Self-sufficiency must give way to meekness. Meekness doesn't mean that we're quiet. I mean, probably I don't seem very meek right now. But meanness is not a personality. It's an attitude about your trust system. We realize that all that we are and have is from God. And we begin to know ourselves as poor in spirit and dependent on God and God alone. Our own misfortunes, our own challenges, our own traumas connect us to the pain of the whole world, which we cannot help but mourn. We don't like mourning. Because mourning is an honest assessment of a true condition. We think less about ourselves and become more merciful to others when we mourn. When we mourn for the condition of the world. We have nowhere else to go and so we turn our focus back to God when we mourn and make ourselves perceive life through the lens of the divine nature and the kingdom culture. Stand to your feet with me this morning. The Beatitudes are not so much about what we do, but how we do. Not so much about our actions, but about our being, our attitudes of being. There are less about actions and more about relationships. You can play. To live the Beatitudes is to live a life of reckless, exuberant self-abandonment. Abandonment to God. Abandonment to destiny. Abandonment to each other. I'm going to say that again. The Beatitudes is to live a life of reckless, exuberant self-abandonment, abandonment to God, and abandonment to our neighbor. That's called love. Love is to abandon yourself to another. Love is not how I feel about you. It's how I'm willing to abandon myself for you. I'm willing to abandon my opinion. I'm willing to abandon my desires. I'm willing to abandon my demands and be vulnerable to you. That's love. Love is exuberant self-abandonment. And trusting God. The only reason we can do that is because we know and trust ourselves that we've already been blessed by God. There's not a person in this room who has not been blessed by God. I can take you in a lot of parts of the world. I can tell you you're all blessed. We are all blessed by God. We live the Beatitudes as a response to God's blessing us. God, you bless me, so I'm going to channel your divinity through my humanity. I'm not going to become intimidating and domineering. I'm going to channel your love through me. That is the way of Christ. That is not only the way forward through this life, but also way to life. If we are to follow Christ, it must become our way of life. Bow your heads for the blessing of God. Father, I pray for your people today that they would embrace 
the prophetic countercultural attack you put on carnal values, on carnal identities and carnal perceptions. We to command right now every demon from hell, every spirit of darkness that feeds self-sufficiency, every demon of darkness that feeds self-identity. And we break the power of it, for none of us stand alone. We have an interdependent reality that we are discovering and being awakened to. And today we have gathered to acknowledge your presence in our midst because you have blessed us and because you have blessed us. We are thankful and grateful that we can serve you all the days of our life. I bless you all in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us profess our faith in Almighty God. We believe in one God. Father Almighty, <coughs> maker of heaven and earth, and all things visible and invisible. We believe in